don't pick too early. Many of the parents really want them to have a head start, have to have lots of skill and lots of things done already. Picking too early, nothing wrong with it, right? They set up for the next stage of success, but actually force them to optimize too early, right? To me, it's just like computer science. Having a non-greedy algorithm is the only way for them to actually explore the problem space. Hi there, welcome to another episode of Chinatown 2.0, a show about Chinese immigrants thriving. I'm your host, Richard Yan. Today, I'm interviewing my friend Stephen C. Stephen is the founder and CEO of a blockchain project named Harmony. For those new to crypto and blockchain, Harmony is a protocol that allows trustless smart contracts. Think of it as a new technology stack on the internet that allows users of computer programs to verify the results by themselves instead of trusting whoever is serving these programs to the users. At recording time, Harmony ranks top 100 in terms of market capitalization for all cryptos. Steven also runs a weekly get-together for entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. Participants are mostly crypto-centric founders, although not exclusively so. The organization is run a bit like a Christian fellowship, except that people don't get up and take turns to describe their relationship with God. Instead, they take turns to talk about their journey in entrepreneurship. And instead of reading scriptures, when they get together, they pitch their businesses, ask for help, and share best practices as well as past failures in business. Every time I leave one of these events, I feel thoroughly rejuvenated. And this is all thanks to Steven's leadership. He has a way of making sure everyone feels included and inspired at these events. And I believe he applies this to the way he runs his organization. Steven and I covered a lot of ground in our chat today. We talked about him being raised on a pig farm in Hong Kong, where he had a free-spirited childhood, how he decided to start his weekly entrepreneur get-together, and why he felt it was important for him to be this extreme matchmaker for these events, how he saw culture building for startups, his past struggles with aimlessness in his career and bumpy personal relationships, how he saw China's rise in its startup scene from the lens of a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, and lastly, from dad to dad, he talked about why he felt it was important to give your kids freedom to explore so that they don't peak too early. At the end, we also had some fun speaking Cantonese. I hope you enjoyed this episode. As usual, don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for a notification. Thank you. Steven, it's a great honor to have you on the show. You are definitely one of the more interesting people I know. And as long-time audience members of my show know, I only interview very interesting people. So you should feel good about that, Steven. Yeah, Richard, this is amazing. Really my uh, pleasure getting to know you for so many years, but really getting to have a longer chat with you. Uh, great to be here. Awesome, awesome, great. Okay, so Stephen, I think in this show we would explore a little bit about certain aspects of you that have not been covered in other types of podcasts, right? So we'll be going down the rabbit hole in terms of your childhood, your child rearing philosophies, mm -hmm. your experiences pre-blockchain, mm -hmm. and things like your leadership style, you know, how you do marketing mm -hmm. and how you think about culture building and so on. Sounds great. So Let's see. Maybe I think to just give our audience members a little bit more background about you for people that aren't familiar with your story, right? Mm -hmm. Can you just give us maybe a few sentences about sure. who you are and uh, the Stephen 101? If you for will. sure. Yeah. I grew up in Hong Kong in a pig farm with my parents and moving to Vancouver when I was 17, really have the first cultural shock. But then again, going to Philadelphia for grad school for another cultural shock that I think it really um, set me my understanding when I go to New York to do my first work at Google, come to Silicon Valley to do my first startup acquired by Apple to go to another big company. Until now, I do my blockchain. I think my story has always been whether China Time 2.0, there will be always the next version of the world there for me to discover, if not even Stephen 2.0. <laughs> sounds good, sounds good. Okay, well, so you mentioned that you grew up in a pig farm in Hong Kong, right? So that's sort of an atypical experience for me, at least, and for people around me. And also, privately, we've had conversations about your experience growing up. You said that you didn't read any outside textbooks or non-textbooks until you were 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit more about that type of upbringing mm -hmm. and what about that type of childhood mm -hmm sort of sets you apart mm -hmm. from your peers mm -hmm. and what types of influences or takeaways you've had from that kind of childhood mm -hmm. that guide you in your life and your career? Mm -hmm. 
I agree that uh, not everyone grow in the pig farms. Definitely not in Hong Kong, most people. At the same time, I do feel I actually have friends that have that level of immigrant story, or whether um, coming to of a big city, coming from more countryside. In particular, my parents actually flee and move to Hong Kong with nothing. They literally swim across the river from Shenzhen to Hong Kong. Wow! Uh, not even a suitcase what year that you can this? carry. Uh, it was uh, right when I was born. Okay. That I have to go. So the immigrant story, if not even now, happening in the world. Are you the only child? I was at that time. Okay. Right? I have three siblings, so four of us. So having the parents literally, when they say usually start from ground, nothing, my parents actually, when they have to go to Hong Kong by swimming across the river, they couldn't carry anything. So in a pig farm setting, we actually were far more exposed to nature, but also hard work. Okay, okay. Um, right. So I do th think your question asking how does it impact me as an yeah. entrepreneur? Well, actually, just let me interject. So your parents sure. went to Hong Kong and then they raised you on a pig farm, right? Yeah. I assume they didn't go there and they just yeah. started owning land, right? Yeah. Were they peasants working on someone else's farm? Or yeah. How did that work? How did they make a living? Yeah, so it was a very tough time to even pick up job. My grandpa, my grandpa, my dad's dad did go to Hong Kong earlier first and uh, setting up some small farm where my dad was the reason why he came. So when by the time I arrived, it was already a family farm. Okay. That's um, probably around the age of, I would say, maybe uh, 10 years or on. Then I okay. would be helping in the farm and so on. Okay, okay. Well, you said something about how yeah. you didn't start reading outside textbooks yeah. until you were 10 years old. So. Why is that? Is it because your parents were super busy with their work? Is it because they just believe that you should just you know grow up on your own? Do they not want you to read books? Uh, both are true. Obviously, they care a lot about education. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, my dad, even though he never even been to finishing middle school, my, my mom never even started high school, that they care about education and all that. At the same time, being pig farmers or just being immigrants at that time, definitely have no time for the kids in terms of like story time, in terms of buying books, in terms of getting toys. I have no toys, no books for sure until 10 years old. But I didn't feel like missing anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. And as a child, you just didn't know. So, um, so you would just hang out in the farm? All, all the days, time. we were just like running around countryside. Yeah, yeah, okay. I told my uh, siblings all just biking around the countryside, yeah. playing soccer probably and what's not. Okay. It was really growing up in the nature. Okay. Um, okay. Experience. Okay. I see. So, sorry, I'm just trying to process that in my head because yeah. I myself come from a background that's hyper tracked, right? right? Like I started reading and writing from very early age. Okay. My parents had very, very specific but also vague expectations for where, where I would become, right? right? And so I'm just trying to understand. So but back to the question of how that part of your childhood mm -hmm. shaped who you are. What kinds of advantages do you think you had compared to, mm -hmm. say, you know, other business associates or mm -hmm. other people you uh, subsequently work with in the industry right? Um, as a result of that kind of unique childhood. And what right. kind of disadvantages do you think you suffered? From? Sure. Whether unique or whether adventure disadvantages is in retrospect. I really like the movie called Seven Up. Yeah. It's a movie series that actually track um, a few kids from seven year old. And every seven year later, they try to tell the story again. Uh, starting with like about 20 of the kids and end up having still about 10 of them that finally now all of them are about 63 year old. And oh wait, so they get interviewed at seven years of age exactly. and then they get interviewed, you know, maybe seven, seven years, years later. later. Exactly. Seven years later, yeah. like a period of seven, seven years. Seven year old, 14, 14 year old, 21. 21 year old. Okay. So it really also gave me the same perspective mm. looking back at my own childhood and growing up. This for Chinese kids? Or uh, it was at UK at that time. Okay. okay. Yeah. So it's a really fantastic film if anyone care about like how someone actually uh, progress and more like documentary style right. and same thing on reflecting on my own i would think the uh, advantage and disadvantage at that time it was really unknown right like my parents finally all moved us to vancouver and then for me to do a grad school looking back i would say definitely the disadvantage right that's uh, by the time i have to go to school high school and was not that you can become very self-conscious with your yeah. classmate right. that uh, being i would say honestly being poor if not like lacking some of the uh, specific school skills right, right really right. force you to be catching up a lot if not like 
trying to fit in, right? Okay. That said, before 10 years old, I was such a free kid. I didn't even know it was such a luxury of just running around and exploring on my own. Right. That I would say all the way, only up to after I graduated PhD in 28 years old, yeah. then you have some technical expertise, you have other mixed experience because of immigration and adapting a new environment. That compared to other business entrepreneurs, if not even an engineer, I would make up more um, in my technical expertise to be the lack of, I would say, language or cultural or historical understanding that for, I would say, under Tiger Moms and uh, if not a better early education would have allowed me that I now have to make up from other things. Oh, I see. So, but the truth is you wouldn't characterize your parents as tiger parents, right? Quite the opposite of it. Quite the opposite, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. But you said something about how yeah. you were, the 10 years old age seemed yeah. to be a watershed moment for you? I would say so. And why, yeah. why is that? Well, even now when I observe other uh, friends' kids, if not just other children growing up anyway, 10 year old is really the split moment where kids really spend a lot of time asking for mom stuff, talking to mom, if not that's Do you think that's the same stuff. for both boys and girls? That can be quite different, right? Yeah. Girl definitely mature earlier. Earlier than But then I would say even roughly around that time, right? Yeah. Whether you really want to just try breaking away and spend way more time with friends that you influence and what you ask. But my parents absolutely was uh, not having expectation of schools, uh, results, yeah. and really let me do most of the things, really set the parenting style for me. Okay, okay. So the reason why I want to focus so much on your childhood is because I see you yeah. as really somebody that has sort of come to a place that exploits your skills in an optimal way. Okay. Meaning, yeah. so there are people that train for certain skills and they get right. a certain job and they right. go to the next thing, right? right? They follow certain expectations, they have a certain North Star. But then there are also people that just sort of, to put it loosely, sort of happy-go-lucky, yeah. but ultimately they're rewarded for what they are, they come to this world as being built for. Right. You see what I mean? Yeah. So in a free society, if you're built to be really good at thinking analytically, right. to really be interested in working with machines, mm -hmm. right? I think those people will benefit greatly. I think right. you are one of those cases. And I'm very fascinated because I really want to find out your parents, do they have this kind of, right. if they're tiger, they're not tiger parents for right. you, were they also sort of free-spirited in terms of life attitude for themselves? Mm -hmm. I would say so. But, so, but, but explain how that reconciles, right, right, between that particular statement with the fact that they yeah. went all the way to Hong Kong and then immigrated to Vancouver, right? right I mean, right. these are like, uprooting mm -hmm. moments, right? For sure. Yeah. So how do you reconcile these two things? Right. Whether like people are self life or success, if not even very early on, compared to being able to optimize and based on their uh, optimism or kindness, I think it's really interesting um, to look in stages, right? That's why I really think that a seven-year snapshot. And the, the great thing about the premises, I go back to the film, is like, give me a child of seven years old and the proverb said they can predict the rest of the man's journey. I would say also true for me, right? I make up okay. for my, uh, as you said, whether I will catch up with the schoolwork in the early stages, but but the early 10 years allowed me to discover myself um, much more. So I would still say the happy go lucky attitude still applies to me because my parents are definitely a happy types. Okay. They don't stress me with like school results. Kindness. They would not stress out about school. Yeah, exams. they would not, okay. right? And okay. the great thing about working on a farm with my parents is day to day I see how they work. Okay. So I, I really learn a lot about the emotion aspect, as about the hard work aspect, more than about like how do I solve a math problem. Mm, I see. Mm. I see. So uh, to summarize, it seems like mm. your parents were sort of free spirited, yeah. but they sort of kept you grounded by having you do hard labor. <laughs> Maybe not hard labor, but more like yeah. just farm work, right? right I mean, right. for them, it's right. just labor. Right? Right. That's how right. you survive, presumably. Right. right. Well, even the framework of your questions yeah. already set the tone of the answer, which I actually think uh, we can think quite differently. Yeah. Right. You said free spirit, you said grounded with hard work. Actually, to my framework and to my child, it's quite the opposite, right? No expectation before 10, no, no, no books, no rules, no toys. But I didn't ask for it. They don't have the means to provide. At the same time, it's really not about granting me the hard work. We need to do that. 
But then they didn't say, hey, you need to finish this before you can do that or achieve that or have that reward. They are day to day in that and they struggle day to day with that, but also in front of my eyes. So that my learning is really more from the emotional aspect, the self reflection, and really knowing what can be the day to day kindness and hard work that my parents show to uh, some of the business people around them. Okay, okay, interesting. So let's talk a little bit about your undertaking after uh, yeah. you became an adult, right? Yeah. So you, as you mentioned in your bio, yeah. you started a startup, mm -hmm. Spot Setter, yeah. Right? Yeah. and then you subsequently sold it to Apple. Mm -hmm. um, and before that, you actually worked at Google for a total of four years as an mm -hmm. engineer. Before that, you did a PhD at Penn, right? Mm -hmm. So do you see yourself following some kind of momentum in your life? Meaning, because there's no guiding light, right? Yeah, yeah. I hate to kind of go back to this whole thing, old topic again, but yeah. there's no one saying, hey, you should do a PhD. Hey, you should look into yeah. startups, yeah. right? You should look into Silicon Valley, right? Yeah. So what were people that you looked up to or mm -hmm. what were some, say, books of influence or what, what yeah. were some moments yeah. that were significant in yeah. shaping yeah. these trajectories for you? Yeah, I actually think it's also the opposite as well. Okay. That uh, my parents, well, none of my immediate family even finished high school, go to college, never mind doing a PhD. Did so that I was your siblings too? Well, I was the first one. Right, right, right. So my uh, two of my sister both had MBA, and my brother is very smart in school as well. That more follow now that I'm being the oldest to see. Okay. But then my other immediate families really uh, wouldn't have gone far as in education. Right. But then the thing is, uh, once I really was able to really explore. When someone asked me, why do you go to grad school or do you PhD for five years? Uh, it's quite a commitment. That yeah, if you were being told that it would be the hard work and commitment to do, probably I wouldn't say so and commit to it. But the fact that I was very early on to be able to discover before 10, uh, of what kind of things I do. And then up to 20, uh, or at least in high school, that I was really free to play with computers the way that I wanted it. Right. For sure, I want to keep just playing with computers and studying for fun, right? Okay. So okay. that really carried me very far. So my question is, yeah. I mean, a lot of kids these days, especially, yeah. are also obsessed with computers, but in a different way. <laughs> they play computer games. I mean, yeah. some of them, be, I mean, 30, I think, no, 50% yeah. sure. of American youth want to become YouTubers, sure, right? Sure. I mean, some are live streaming. Some actually make yeah. a living doing esports, right? Yeah. yeah. So in what way were you obsessed with computers that yeah. were more productive, right? Like, why did you not decide right. want to... You just wanted to play games all the time. Right, Maybe you right. did. Well, that's a great question. I think back in the day, and we know many of the Silicon Valley engineers too, right? They they explore computer quite productively, as you said. For me, it was just more that there was no limit what they can do, right? They program, yeah. they figure out how hardware works. They actually be able to assemble yeah. and disassemble the radios to what kids learn these days, right? They have to go to class and finish this homework, play games only, like they got too deep in something that right. they have no way to become um, even a meaningful like uh, portfolio of work to, to go to the next level, right? Okay. I think the opportunity today is actually uh, you eliminate many of the breakout as well. Right. For me at that time, I was really literally, even though we were so poor, honestly, to have a computer that uh, no one even tell me what to do with it. Yeah, yeah. That uh, I was really using it to explore the operating system, assembly language, and learning how to uh, host a BBS at that time. That uh, I think the lack of structure allowed the whole, I will say, my life story of just exploration much, much deeper. Do you think it's possible in a parallel universe, yeah. or maybe if you just look around you, right? right. People of similar upbringing and background yeah. basically ended up on the other end of the spectrum. Right. Right? Maybe right. they don't aspire right. to do graduate school. They don't aspire to right. you know, starting companies. They just wanted right. to play games all day and right. just, yeah. I don't know, for boys just chase women and <laughs> have fun. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, again, the framework already like uh, kind of forced the binary choices, right? But I don't think so. So for people that play games called Vitalik, they turn out fine because like he has like deep passion for math or, and parents of like education. He was a gamer. Yeah. yeah, he was a gamer. So I think talking about whether it's a violence or games um, actually forces you to like have a classified that may not be meaningful. To me, it was literally having the options to explore opportunities live and like uh, study on my own. That is far more, far more interesting that uh, I think that may define it. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's move on and talk a little bit about your mm -hmm. 
leadership experience, right? Yeah. So I, I met you through TGIML, which stands yeah. for, thank God, it's machine learning, right? Yeah. You've had that organization for over three years now. Yeah. You've basically been keeping this going even during the well, pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, much more, right? During pandemic, you actually kept the community alive on mm -hmm. Telegram and on, on WeChat. Mm -hmm. So maybe talk a little bit about the reason why you wanted to start something like this mm -hmm. and what kept you going. What has been the biggest challenges, aside from the fact that yeah. it can get, like, sometimes people don't show up. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So why I started that was uh, right after Apple. It'll be like, wow, now I have all the free time, I have all the skill and experience of doing the first startup. Doing the second startup was such a struggle. The um, paralysis because of analysis is really true at that time. That I really felt like that I have the ideas, even the skill set, but I don't have the support network to bounce off the ideas. That I still remember back at Google days that uh, having a group of people that brings on the social aspect of the journey was so important. Yeah. And being an entrepreneur is very uh, lonely at times. That. That TGI really, really was the breeding ground for my own ideas and many of our friends. That's why we really kept it going for three years, four hours at a time, every week, went very, very deep. So the biggest challenge was having a few of that core people that enjoy that experience. Right. They will come regardless. Right. It's not about like you get funded or your ideas will have this co-founders to work with you. I think that really set it apart, even though the challenges of finding that small group was hard, we really managed to uh, coming back week to week because each of us there really enjoys it. Okay, sounds good. So the, the interesting thing about TGI, right? The, yeah. one, one of the reasons why I find you very fascinating, right? Is that you have this very unique style mm -hmm. of forced networking in a way, right? <laughs> so you get people together, you're very nice yeah. to them, you serve yeah. them food, you serve them beer, yeah. you actually get someone to play the piano, right? <laughs> At the cost of maybe you or the project, yeah. the, the project that you lead. Yeah. And uh, But one very unique aspect is that when someone is actively engaged in the conversation, you pull them right. away, right? right? And then you say, hey, you, you should meet this other person. Right, right, right. And then after a while, you like force them to remingle again, right? <laughs> and the short, there's short-term discomfort, but in the long run, it really benefits the participants because that's the yeah. whole point of networking. You want right. to increase your exposure, maximize right. the number of people and right. the ideas that you uh, encounter, right? I've never seen anyone do that before, right? <laughs> so what is the reason right. why you do that? And um, did you learn it from somebody? Is it just your nature? <laughs> do, you, do you guys do that in the home? Right. I, I would definitely call that the speed dating experience in New York. Okay. I, I actually think that that forces me to think about what kind of network events, social events, I would say, yeah. that I would like to attend. Usually, the, the first few minutes conversation is like, what did you do? Where did you go to school? What kind of work you're doing? Actually, it's very boring. And then the last few minutes is like, here's my contact. Let's have a coffee. And this is the phone call that we should talk about. It's also very boring. It doesn't go deep. Obviously, if I have like 10 people every day to have this level of conversation, it's better, right? But I think the speed dating is way in the middle, right? They force you to talk 10 minutes, if not 15. But then the host will set you up the context. The host actually read the whole LinkedIn or your work or ask you to submit the paper so that you can come to this meetup. It's what I actually, after uh, almost a half a year um, to do the second like, startup, that whenever I go, I really want to learn more, right? When I know you, I want to know where you go to school, where you, even you go to high school. That the host, if the few people come, I actually thought can really set up that context. So that, of course, being Yang Gao is like very awkward, yeah. but the host can be the gracious host to actually force that conversation right. so that you, you can actually know more context of patient right away. Okay, okay. That is very interesting. I think that more people will probably be doing this, knowing yeah. that this actually does not anger the guest. Right. It's unconventional, but it's actually something that keeps people from coming back, keeps people coming back. Yeah, yeah, hope so. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's talk a little bit about culture building, right? I think this is another part where I think you're very strong, right? So you're always in that shirt, right? I hope it's a different shirt, but right. it's the same, same color, same, right. same shade. Yeah. And so your company has a unique attachment to the number one, right? Mm -hmm. You show uh, number one in your pictures. Right. Your token is one, O-N-E. Yeah. And you also send out these slogans attached uh, with relation to one. Mm -hmm. Here's to the crazy ones, mm -hmm. uh, day one, mm -hmm. right? Every day is day one by um, Jeff Bezos from yeah. Amazon, right? So why are you so 
focused on culture building? Do you think it's effective? Mm -hmm. What do you think is the underappreciated aspect and overappreciated aspect mm -hmm. with culture building in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley? Yeah, I actually think it's an export of Silicon Valley, if not like Google being Googly and uh, like Apple having the creative energy of uh, Silicon Valley way of innovation that I, I think is quite picked up now, even okay. in China. So by then specifically said, like they put all the cultural um, values on the painting on the wall. I do think that it is a clear differentiation when individually everyone have their values and ideas and what they really want to make an impact. But collectively, as uh, Homo sapiens, the book said, right, we need to tell the story. We need to remind ourselves why we actually still come back together as a group. I actually think that whether having a name so that people can associate with, whether having a very simple word that we always repeat is actually the hardest thing. Now that we have so many choices, it's always about the attention as an economy, but also as a team, the reason to stay. Now that we have more choices, whether as a DAO on blockchain or on Twitter or different groups, the, the name and the logo and even the a slogan to me is even more important. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I yeah. definitely agree. It's just that and so I work in Silicon Valley. I've actually met founders that I think have a sort of chilling cynicism when it comes mm -hmm. to culture building. They, mm -hmm. the, their approach is actually formulaic mm -hmm. because their VCs say so or they mm -hmm. come from organizations that have done so, right? Mm -hmm. So then they say, okay, these are our values and then they have mm -hmm. quizzes to their employees. What are our values? <laughs> but I just think it gets so mechanical, right? And right. you talk about Chinese companies that do it yeah. and I, I, I agree. I think there are some companies that have very, very strong culture. But I think the execution is so important. I right. think if you tr just do something mm -hmm. like that you think other people are doing and it's mm -hmm. not really you, it's not mm -hmm. authentic, mm -hmm. it actually shows, like people mm -hmm. will find out, right? Mm -hmm. So I think my question to you is mm -hmm. the, the value that you espouse, right? Mm -hmm. I have zero doubt that mm -hmm. that page on harmony. Mm -hmm. slash com, culture slash yeah. culture is written yeah. by you, right? right. Period, right? right? But how do you fully embody that mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to say, yeah. right? And yeah. why do you think there's a difference between someone mm -hmm. like you mm -hmm. who believes in those things and someone else that's just like, yeah. I'm just here to make a business, right? I need to hire all these people. And right. somebody told me that yeah. I need to have these cultural things so right. that they will stick around, they'll be more loyal, that's I can true. pay them less, and then we can optimize the goal of, For sure. of the business. Yeah. So I fully agree with you that uh, it can be completely different, yeah. especially a very well-defined task. You're just like very transactional or like uh, the performance is very clear how to even award the top performer, even of a close team, small team, or big team, that the task is very well defined. It really doesn't talk about anything beyond, do I get to know your family? Should we have an offsite that just have a drink and have a chat as a team? That works too, right? Very transactional, freelancer model, if not a team very, very, very clearly engineering driven to the task level. Yeah. The opposite of it is Alibaba and ByteDance, right? Alibaba still talk about their 80 year, 100 year journey, right? It's crazy, stupid. And it's not because their lack of uh, the founders' technical understanding, right? Because ByteDance is the same thing. They talk about culture because that would weather through of completing some task, weather through market correction, weather through whether it's big success or really hard time now, right? I agree with you, it shouldn't be VC asked you to do that and you just write down a few things. When I wrote that down uh, almost three and a half years ago at that time, people criticized, Does it, is it meaningful? I think it really comes down to much later on, three years later, that we haven't changed one single word. Yeah, 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 right. But you know what's interesting though is that I really feel that you are probably the biggest believer in the cultural points that you have set out, mm -hmm. right? And there are CEOs that are trying to make themselves useless, right? There's a saying where you try to like kill one job each day from the CEO, mm -hmm. and then the organization becomes this machine, mm -hmm. this, this automaton, right? Mm -hmm. That just executes, right? Yeah. So I, to be honest with you, I think your organization yeah. would be totally different if you were not here. I mean, TGI is different if you're not here. Like I don't see a team member trying to yank people and then try to network with each other. So. I guess the point I'm trying to make is yeah. just that I think you very much uniquely embody this culture and as much as some CEOs try mm -hmm. to break away from it and try mm -hmm. to get their team to be more autonomous, mm -hmm. I, I think it's hard. Yeah, I, I think the interesting thing is uh, as we scale, does the culture still stay? As we talk to external people, do they understand the culture even though they don't interact with you? The most strange thing is last year, 
right? Our right. team has been very like close in person. We live in a hacker house. We go to 996 for like two and a half years before we have to break away because of the COVID. Now your culture, does it last COVID? It was really hard, right? Because yeah. we share so much of the personal time. You also say it's true. If that only works because the CEO keep talking well and the only one model for the culture, that wouldn't last. And that showed too last year. But then uh, I think we both do both extreme, doing the whole writing, just do more written communication so that it's not about us people and soft part and soft skill. But at the same time, we really treasure this kind of like one, one-on-one talk, but also small like drink and basketball game with our community. Those you cannot really write it down. Okay. So far, we've been talking about very positive things, sunshine and rainbow, right? I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. I really think that you very embody this positive energy. Right. Can you talk a little bit about some of these more challenging times? Right. Maybe right. aside from 2020, like that's right. just been terrible for everybody, right? right? Except, you know, at the end of 2020 when we've had bull market. <laughs> but so maybe talk about some challenges. It could be at your current organization, maybe sure. prior to this, yeah. but a challenge that sort of got you as close as possible sure. to feeling like you were in a rut, right. as in you were in a ditch and you're right. just like, I don't want to do anything. I don't understand why I'm doing this. Right. And I don't, I just don't see a way forward. And right. maybe you, I don't know, I picture you sitting on your couch and just reading a book or watching YouTube <laughs> all the time, right? Much worse. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> well, yeah, let's talk about it, right? Right, right. Yeah. I, I think, um, well, someone has as much freedom and when I emphasize to explore the world, um, that is also a given that I have lots of downtime, um, a lost uh, period. As a matter of fact, my, my good friend, which is my last co-founder in my last startup, said that was a, the walkabout period of Stephen, right? Just go to um, uh, really a long... Uh, Wait, walk about period of Stephen. This is a right. period of time right. when he felt that you were wandering and exactly, you were lost. Right? Not, um, the, obviously, in the Africa um, culture, they really have to go into the forest and really go figure out their own before they come back. Oh, exactly. Sorry, when was this? Uh, I would say every now and then. <laughs> Most people only see a certain part of that, right? A certain yeah. period of the time, especially yeah. when you move around. That uh, I would definitely say that uh, every time I have to uproot myself from Hong Kong to Vancouver, Vancouver to Philadelphia, Philadelphia to back to uh, Asia and then go to Silicon Valley was really tough, right? But then the particular tough period uh, was um, when I have the really uh, of um, set path of going to work in at Google and then I say, really doesn't work. Let me figure out whether I can do startup. And it took a full year almost before I come back to Silicon Valley and what, what did you not enjoy towards the end of your life at Google? It was not about enjoy. It's like, uh, I want to know what's next. I want to okay. really figure out if I am single and alone in New York, whereas my family's uh, like value was really strong. I'm ready to find my partner and get married, right? That I was not doing that in New York, right? I was really thinking about startup and not doing that in New York, right? That I took quite almost six months all the way to before I come to Silicon Valley, before I really figure out what I want to do next. So that was definitely of a wandering around period that it was quite a struggle at times. During times you wonder, I think everyone wonders a little bit differently, right? right. Maybe like for some people, they would just go on marathons, which yeah. in my case, I don't think that's wondering. That's being actually extremely <laughs> Training, productive. Right? Yeah. Yes. And then yeah. for some people, they're just like lying in bed and not doing anything right, or right. just, I don't know, like just being idle, right? right? Like what's wondering for you? Well, there are definitely the physical, social, but also with the career path or your journey of uh, staying in course, right? So my wondering is usually alone, really isolated, and uh, okay. no direction to go. In my first startup, no customers, no money. In my second startup, no directions and high expectation. So those were really tough. And there were really period of time I physically was struggling, right? I went on to do yoga, couldn't work. What year was this? Uh, so that was uh, when I was in Vancouver before coming to Silicon Valley. Right, I was physically okay, not very I see. well. I see, yeah. I see. So I guess this is the part I actually missed. So, yeah. okay, so you grew up in Hong Kong, you moved in Vancouver <laughs> with your family, right, right? right? And then you moved to Penn, yeah. right? 
and then you went to New York or right. Google, right? Right, right. And then you went back to Asia. Okay. Yeah. So my parents said, "Come back to Hong Kong and get married." Right. Um, okay. That didn't work. So I escaped to Vancouver to see. Like, so I guess your came. parents are completely free spirited. Well, there are definitely expectation of okay. uh, family that uh, my my parents did good give good advice, right? And okay. To me, it still makes sense. Otherwise, um, it would not be uh, quite a wake up call um, at that level. Well, I don't understand. So they yeah. told you to go back to Hong Kong to get married because well, they found someone for you? <laughs> well, I, it, that would have been easy, right? Um, oh, but they're like, okay, yeah. dude, you got to get married. Just come back to Hong Kong and like find somebody. This is your KPI, right? Well, a KPI, mm-hmm. that's a good way to it. Well, they didn't say as such, but I've been away from the family and my parents for many years, right? Okay. It's still to me, it makes sense to spend some time with the parents. Okay. It didn't work, not because the family time didn't work. It's just okay. that I couldn't bootstrap in the career out of it. When I go back, like... The the people that I meet, both career but also right. uh, romantic wise, it wouldn't, it didn't work out. Right? Okay. okay, that's um, really it's very strange. Even though now I'm much older now, yeah. at that time my physical, my social, my career was like really at the bottom. I must say. Okay, um, and there will be other period of my life that I like, have really serious sleep problem, skin problem because like really skin problems. Yeah, okay. I have all kind of physical problem that I really don't know how to yeah. how, how I, I even got out of it. That it's very easy to say, I just wander around, try different ideas, I have a few product things that I was prototyping. But at the same time, physically, socially, uh, career-wise, it was never clear. Wow, gosh. I guess everyone has um, that side of them. I'm really glad that I got to uh, talk to you about it. I'll say so. Okay, okay. So let's talk a little bit about the sense of community, Mm -hmm. right? So... We're both in blockchain, right? We understand the importance of building community. Right. And in fact, I think that even outside of blockchain, there will be a lot of businesses that are launched mm-hmm. to be community first. Right. Right. The idea there is that you basically have sort of centripetal force to get some people together and then you sort of figure out what their needs are. Right. Yeah. It's right. very interesting and, and works in reverse. What do you think? is the reason why, I mean, we talked about the fact that you wanted to have a community to help kickstart some ideas. Mm -hmm. And then it also helps in in other very practical ways, right? Mm -hmm. Recruiting, networking, Mm -hmm. information. Absolutely. But I feel that there's something about you, like Mm -hmm. authentically so, Mm -hmm. like non-business, in non-business ways, you want to be around people. You want to like have this community to serve them, right? Right. Do you think that's something that runs in your family? Do you mm. think that's your personality? Do you see that in your siblings? Mm. Do you think that aspect of you has grown over time? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. It can't possibly just be because you are Google. You're like, hmm, these people are <laughs> running some community. Okay, I'm going to do that. I'm yeah. so anti-community, but I'm just going to do it. Right? right? Like there's something intrinsic about that desire. I come from a background where yeah. people like very much work independently alone, right? right? And they don't really get the idea of building community. Right. 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 Yeah. And and the other thing is that it's not just about community of your work. It's also community of the this TGI concept, right? A lot of people don't work at Harmony at all. They come, they get the free beer and they they get the free (laughs) free information, right? Right. They have the free good time. Right. And aside from this, there's also the online community that you're building, right? Right. You're very generous in terms of sharing new things that you've um, come across Mm -hmm. and pictures that you have taken of Mm -hmm. your teams Mm -hmm. and just, and the thing is that this might come very natural to you, right? You might be wondering like, what what else am I supposed to be doing? I'm just curious, like yeah. any thought about how your journey right. in terms of realizing the importance mm-hmm. of building community and sticking with that and any advice for someone yeah. for, in, in terms of how they can bootstrap community mm-hmm. to maybe maybe set up a business mm-hmm. for that community in the future. Right. I think the phrase you use is the best way to think about recognizing the importance. I think especially for like engineers or for someone that even our childhood was not like lots of parties or lots of people, the importance of it is really, really come very clear later in life, right? For sure, I've learned since in, in, in high school and not. but then when you are like thinking about a startup, you just want to make a prototype happen, you're an engineer, you just want to read paper and research on your own, that the importance of it, I will call it the... Uh, whole idea of the isolation is a dream killer. You have a big dream, you have the passion to make it happen, you even have the skill to build it. But then because you are isolated, you are thinking in your head, even just the two co-founders, it really doesn't work. Very soon, if you don't have the social part of it, 
I run into that I even keep working on it for weeks and then I'll just completely stop because compared to teacher I come back and talk to people about my ideas they would actually give me a hard time say still doesn't work still not launch it actually the social part of keeping it together was so critical yeah um, that I find that it was uh, not just for business I want to enjoy the beer, I want to play basketball with a few people, especially entrepreneurs, because uh, there's so many of the elements of the human spirit that sharing the dream is the only way, not even to make the dream happen and realize and recruit to make it happen, is actually make the meaning of okay. the dreams. So the other part about building a community is to be not afraid of competition, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you're generous with your time and information, mm -hmm. you hope that people mm -hmm. reciprocate, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe the way you think about it is that even if they don't reciprocate, you're still mm -hmm. getting things out, out of that interaction regardless. Mm -hmm. But are there, I, I'm really curious, are there times mm -hmm. where you have met somebody or heard about mm -hmm. a project or a business, mm -hmm. right? That has that is fairly comparable to you mm -hmm. in terms of profile, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe someone that has similar education background and mm -hmm. IQ, and then maybe a business that has very similar setup and mm -hmm. ambitions. Um, but ultimately they just do better, mm -hmm. right? Per your metrics. Right. And have you ever looked at them and felt, gosh, I'm so <laughs> jealous. Yeah. And I'm so <laughs> so um angry at myself and also like yeah. just angry at them. Or yeah, like well, jealous for sure. Um, easily, I mean, throughout the teacher of three years, they are really That does not show, by the way. I, I do not <laughs> sense an iota of it. Right, yeah. so there are definitely friends that like get the co-founders before me, get their like hire before I manage to like talk to the same person, fundraise, even the same idea of blockchain, AI, that they are really project that uh, we, we got to talk and they do much better than we do, right? And I think that's the power of the community. That uh, without this community, I wouldn't even be able to even have the ideas and even the momentum. But then someone out of it would do much better than I do. Uh, get the right match. There's even people that actually out of the uh, meetup that we do every week, find their wives, find oh. their girlfriends, literally, right? That right. it may not be as what may be possible that I would be jealous about and uh, get more out of them or compete with them. I, I truly believe believe that uh, information are very free now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even code and prototypes and even the technical development is really not the differentiation, but the people that I spend time with and the ideas that we can bring together. Okay, yeah. okay. Let's talk a little bit about China, right? Mm -hmm. So you're from Hong Kong, but you're originally born in China, mm -hmm. right? And you had mentioned privately to me once that yeah. a trip to China, I think it was 2018, mm -hmm. right? Really gave you new ideas and inspirations for mm -hmm. your startup, mm -hmm. right? In 2018, that was only mm -hmm. three years ago, mm -hmm. right? And so you already went to work for Google, Apple, mm -hmm. you did your, the whole, whole nine yards of startup. Right. And yet going back to China gave you new source of mm -hmm. information and energy, right? Can you talk a I little did. bit about that? Yeah. My group friend Z forced me to jump on the plane while I was young, <laughs> killing my family. So, so your family didn't go with you? You went by yeah, yourself? Yeah, just by myself. First business trip to China. Couldn't speak Mandarin, but I was forced to have... This is your first time to China? Yeah, uh, I visited a lot. Yeah, okay. I mean, I toured um, before, but then never for business, right? And okay. it's a completely different conversation. You are set up for meetings, yes, and yes. you are forced to talk um, like about like, how to close deals and whatnot. Okay. So I think the biggest inspiration well, yeah. and also when you went, sure. you didn't have specific business objectives in mind, right? You were just like scouting. Yeah, well, of course, we wish to learn more about ideas. We, we, we did research and learn okay. about what kind of people we can meet and what is going on in China. Completely changed when we get there, right? It's really about the speed of China, yeah. specifically the speed of Shenzhen. That was yeah. so impressive. And then the hunger and the foolish of the entrepreneurs there that we, we knew what stay hungry and stay foolish mean. But when you were there for like two weeks, yeah. every day everyone around you at that speed and at that passion, and so scrappy, absolutely have nothing, so little compared to what Silicon Valley offer, yeah. that it really forced you to re-examine yourself, right? Yeah. Even though you've done startup, you know what the VC, big ideas mean, to execute at that level, to have that hunger. It's not about the money that we raise, but actually the spirit that we got back, that changed me. Okay. Yeah. So before you went, maybe you had a vague idea that you wanted to do something right. with blockchain, right? Right, right? Okay, so you already did. Okay, right. so a couple of things, right? Number one is that you, you came from Silicon Valley. Silicon mm -hmm. Valley 
you know, many still consider to be mm -hmm. the um, leader of innovation Absolutely. and uh, just uh, a place where people come and try to change the world, For right? Sure. So when you went from there to China, and mm -hmm. yet you seem to have had some kind of cultural shock. It was. Why do you think that's the case? Is mm -hmm. Silicon Valley lagging behind in mm -hmm. terms of the dreamer mentality, mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of work ethic? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that how you felt? Well, for sure, it's a personal individual level, right? Collectively, there's no doubt Silicon Valley, there's no comparison of the history, of the opportunity, top research now, both uh, Anderson and Stanford, just these two alone right. trump everything else, right? right? But personally, I was not. Right. When I was in Silicon Valley, I could have talked to even many Googlers doing blockchain Bitcoin at that time, but I right. didn't have that access or even that mentality to. But going back to China, forcing yourself to pack all the actions in two weeks, seeing all the other business. I'm really curious because yeah. you were at Google and you've been yeah. in Western society for a while now, right? I, I Why do you think that you have more mm -hmm. access to China than here, yeah, that I'm good. Yeah, so not not collectively, right? I don't know everything in Silicon Valley. Definitely not everything that China has to offer. But then in that two weeks, fully packed schedule. Even though we were very fast paced, every week coming out of TGI, we were trying to account with each other. That two weeks didn't give me a choice. I talked to probably like easily hundred people, pitched the same idea hundred times, right? And I see all the entrepreneur around me that uh, really excel at that speed. I mean, for sure, Silicon Valley, when you go to YC, so at that this, speed. Was this a roadshow then in 2018? It was somewhat of a roadshow. Okay, okay, we okay. really did a lot of presentation, okay. talking to investors, many entrepreneurs that we went to, we visited Tencent. Uh, that okay. was quite eye-opening. I see. I, I think I understand now, right? So you went there and mm -hmm. the primary, one of the primary objectives mm -hmm. is to try to mm -hmm. source funding, right? Yeah, fundraise, try to work with collaborators, right. really learn from the entrepreneurs there. Right, right, right. And then when you went to these events, obviously you would network with co-presenters, right? Mm -hmm. Some other exactly. people with ideas and yeah. that's how you get to know them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, for people, if in Silicon Valley, if you force yourself to do that exact same thing, but that shift of mentality is very important. Maybe that's why people travel, maybe people do the emergency. Uh, I thought it was really amazing for me. Okay, okay. All right, so have you thought about possibly doing mm -hmm. something China-related mm -hmm. down the road? Yeah. Do you think there's a, a preference in you mm -hmm. in terms of uh, mm -hmm. geographical location, mm -hmm. strictly business on the business side, mm -hmm. not, not mm -hmm. in terms of your life, in mm -hmm. terms of, not mm -hmm. in terms of raising your children or mm -hmm. enjoying life or being close to your parents or right. something, right. Right. who are in Hong Kong right now, I believe, mm -hmm. right? They are. Yeah. So, just strictly from a business perspective, mm -hmm. why would you want to be in China or why would you not want to be in China? Right. Business perspective, I don't think I get to the bottom of it. To understand how you even bootstrap, sustain, if not grow and work with the business uh, ecosystem, especially hard in fintech and blockchain, right. cryptocurrency for sure, that I don't think I have that story here. I wanted to, I want to learn more, but more from a curiosity point of view, right? right. Innovation is there, definitely a lot of great research. If I ever got to, I would be right in the middle. Not just strictly personal, but not about trying to make money there either. Hopefully it will be about research, education, okay. and really be an immersion of like what the innovation there. So there's more neutral ground, so they have some to say and some to give as well with the education in our lectures, but not all the way to say, hey, I need to make money and kill these competitors. Right, right. When you look at the development of China, do you mm -hmm. see it as something that you are mm -hmm. purely only curious about, but mm -hmm. don't feel nostalgic about? As mm -hmm. in, do you have any emotional, emotional attachment mm -hmm. to good news coming out of China, <laughs> right? Whether it be CBDC, right. uh, central bank digital currency development, right. or whether it be, let's say, some successful company like right. BD, for example, going IPO or something, right? right? right, right. Do, do you look at it as, like, do you see it the same way you would say, look yeah. at Switzerland right? or Nigeria, for right, instance, right. right? Or is there a particular shade yeah. of you being sort of ethnically related to that? Oh, there are. Um, but is it very strong or is it just more like, well, yeah, I guess. I well, mean, I strong to the sense that I really like the food there. <laughs> food, okay. Yeah, I really want to bring my kids as you, even though you asked me to talk about that later, um, that, yeah, yeah. like that culture, whether it's not nostalgic or like very fundamental as a ethnicity, I think it's always there. Right? You enjoy mm -hmm. the food, know the language, you know the history behind it. But in China business, it's not just about the metric either. 
right? It's not because Alibaba or like any company doing so well, that's why I need to be there, right? That there are fundamental reason why there, I definitely see the Western shift um, to be more accelerated innovation in the East. Okay. That whether China and India that we've been to, Vietnam and uh, Singapore that I've been to, that China is still very meaningful to me. But I'm not naive to the hurdle and the barrier and the political climate either. Right. That I'm a little bit like sensible if right. you hear me say about research there, that I, I, I do think the balance is important though. Okay. The kind of innovation though, to me, it mm-hmm. seems like the fundamental innovation actually happens mm-hmm. at the national mm-hmm. level, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So for example, central bank digital currency. And in mm-hmm. fact, some people might not even think that's innovation, right? right? Yeah. If you just think about the lines of code, yeah. right, it's probably not that big of a deal. But right. I think if it's a matter of the sort of resources that mm-hmm. the government can mobilize at right. a finger snap mm-hmm. and be able to deliver, that really seems innovative, right? Mm-hmm. But on an individual level, but you know, you and I are not connected to right. the government. And right. if we were to try to do something in China mm-hmm. on an individual grassroots right. level, right? right? Maybe not you, maybe someone else, right? right. What, what advantage do they have? What kind of new innovation is there for them? Yeah, I think it's really tough. I think you're right. Blockchain innovation, there's no reason why Andreessen and Stanford couldn't have done better in general research. I would. I have a framework. I think zero to one innovation clearly now is in Silicon Valley. Yeah. I, I think I will still stay here for many years for this reason. But then to scale from the one, meaning ideas or ideas, source code is or ideas, research is already being published, right. to millions, if not literally a billion people, yeah. China really figure out a way all the hurdles in between, right, bring to right. the market. Right. They always say that the problem is so much more interesting. It may not be a new idea, but I think that will change very quickly. Okay. People already know in AI field that uh, for the longest time people have been copying code, just doing the same research of uh, derivatives. But then, just like phones, just like robotics, clearly now the innovation is already in China. Okay. So maybe let's shift gears a little bit and talk about yeah. family, right? Sure. So you have four children. Yeah. Right? And you had a childhood. Mm-hmm that it will be very difficult to replicate at this point for them. Yeah. Right? I don't know if you want to, but yeah. I don't even know how. Yeah. So there are certain elements of your childhood that you found, a lot of it, right, that you found yeah. to be very rewarding, right? Right. So how do you make sure that they get that, that kind of experience? I think you're absolutely right. The challenge for our generation is we have seen immigration story. We have seen like how this society have changed. I don't think I can prepare my kids that but in terms of education and schooling, we're more specific philosophy, right? I really think that having no structure, no expectation, people call it the unschooling. Yeah. If not, I would even call it the unparenting. To me, that could be a, a good thinking about how my wife and I see our kids. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, like, for example, Offline, we talked about the fact that you mm-hmm. tried to teach them as much computer science as possible. Yeah. Your oldest is, what, eight, nine years old? I mean, that's really early for computer science, right? right. I don't even know what you teach them. But right. don't you think that's already yeah. a not unparenting? <laughs> right? That's a really good one. And, and what if they resist? And what kind sure. of reaction have you been getting? Absolutely. I think unschooling and parenting have lost a lot of uh, meaning. Maybe let me use another analogy. Don't peak too early. Many of the parents really want them to have a head start, have to have lots of skill and lots of things done already. Picking too early, nothing wrong with it, right? They set up for the next stage of success, but actually force them to optimize too early, right? To me, it's just like computer science. Having a non-greedy algorithm is the only way for them to actually explore the problem space. And the world is changing so fast, the future is quite unknown. I want my kids to be so much potential first, to have so much reserve of knowing themselves, exploring the nature, so that their emotional communication is so fundamental. That it's not about the coding that they will learn from me, from the parents, that don't peak too early. Um, actually force them not to go through the school curriculum, having the structure of even learning having them to be quite no rules, but to explore on their own is really our thinking. Wow, that's, I, I love it. Don't peak too early. I think I'm, <laughs> I, I peak way too early. Okay. <laughs> so th- that probably means no piano lessons, right? So like, I know, yeah. Nothing like that. Yeah. No ballerina lessons. Right, right. Some parents say, oh, my kid's wasting time. Right. 
What do you think of that statement? How do you what do you classify as wasting time anyway? Right, right, right. I mean, I don't know. So maybe you. Actually... No, that's a really, really good one, right? Like, are they just idling whole day at home, right? So you ask me a tough question, right? Like, what do I provide them now? Yeah. Can I tell them even about inspiration of coding and technical and entrepreneurship now? I do think that uh, my idea of unparenting is not that we don't provide them anything. To me, if anything, it's not about my lack of like financial assets or even books that defined me. It's about I was so close to my parents when they do what they enjoy and show the kindness when I see them in action. That I hope to actually literally spend time with my kids, no matter how little it is, so that they know here's the opportunities, here's what they can enjoy. It's not about the piano lessons. My kids go to rhythmic gymnastics that they fully enjoy. Arithmetic gymnastic? Yeah, rhythmic gymnastic is really something they, they really So it's enjoy. like math camp basically? Yeah, but then like really doing like very flexible routines. Uh, they do it with, with their bodies. Yeah, with the body, with dance, with uh, props, like throwing a ball and catching in different ways. Really cool. Mm -hmm. That uh, it's not about whether forcing them to do the math camps or gymnastic camps. It's about um, the structure of it is very flexible so that they can really explore. Definitely, definitely lots of unscheduled downtime, playtime. So that is really not about packing of the whole summer and no expectation to. Quite a struggle yeah. uh, all the time, yeah. Say your daughter yeah. gets a hold of your Alexa at home, mm -hmm. listens to songs from it, and she's supposed to go to bed at night. Right, right. She right. listens to it till <laughs> You find out the next day. Right, right. What do you do? Yeah, I know that's your kid, so. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so I, I didn't get to share with you at that time, but my kids are doing the opposite. So I know you told me that you will really have a talk with them and yes. tell them that this is uh, not the right way. Yeah. We are doing the opposite now. The funny thing about, true to what we said, right? The future yeah. is changing, the environment is changing. We change our ideas too about how to parent our kids and it has to, right? Every parent read everything about uh, how to do parenting before the first kid, if not even uh, on the way. We change a lot. And that's the whole, even exploring how to be a parent. To myself, right? So my kids, we definitely don't want them to have screen time very early on, but now they actually have like, well, I think it's okay to say, they have like more than a few hours every day now, right? Okay. So, and they sleep very late, right? And we struggle with that, but we are really okay with, now, with them now. We talk to them about it, we tell them what will be the consequences, they couldn't get up. My kid at one point was waking up at 11 a.m. in the morning. This that's not how you, <laughs> yeah, I know. That's not how you planned it, right? Yeah. But then we tell them the consequence, right? They will miss school, they will miss classes, they actually miss like a uh, like, uh, schedule, I like, think. That's why even our life right now, me and my wife, uh, it's very unscheduled, right? We actually don't try to set up play days or even like birthday parties. We try to be an, as unstructured as possible so that they really get the benefit of very flexible. Wow. Okay. Well, Stephen, um, this has been great. I, I think it would be fun to speak to you in Cantonese a little bit. Yeah. And I, I want to ask you some very um, profound questions in Cantonese and also translate for my viewers. Sure, sure. So, you mm -hmm. uh, they are saying, 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 關於英文的問題,因為我看過你寫Twitter上面寫的東西都非常幸運流水 點樣去catch 如果我應該自己就說我已經很舒服了
呃、我自己覺得，你意思係想你想做個俾佢哋一個榜樣咁樣？唔單止係一個榜樣，我自己對人生有個觀點、啊、我自己幾年都學咗好多嘢，好多之前我一直都唔會，譬如話就算做 interview 啊，講國語啊，直至到去做 branding 啊呢啲其他。你搞 CFA 啊，我睇到，<笑>哦、真係犀利。係啊，好多完全冇諗過去去去學嘅嘢。而家所有嘅 blush 同 financial product， 我覺得我自己人生雖然話而家有咁多嘅誒、呃、機會，但係。其實仲有好多可以去做。嚟翻講英文都一樣啦我一直都冇花時間去學，或者我冇機會去學。去到温哥華好多，即係香港人好中意我度，都冇特別需要去學。直至到學英文嘅 Philadelphia， 學國語啊，嚟、呃、到、呃、中國或者圈子度，我覺得誒個、呃、語言上係好困難。如果你唔早啲學嘅話，你一定唔會，你一定唔會 fluent、呃。但係可以 compensate。我都可以，我都可以，可以可以補充補充到之後。係，我覺得你學習能力真係好強咯。所以我喺喺喺 Twitter 上面其實花多啲時間專心睇下人哋點樣 tweet。嚇嚇，苦功呢啲係苦功，但係誒嗰個諗法先係重要咯。你講得啱，係可以學到，但係個苦功一定係有。係。好。好 ，Steven。哇哇。呃 ，first of all，I just want to quickly <笑> so Steven said something very profound about、yeah. the fact that he treat, literally treats every day as day one、right. because he thinks that even though he's already done quite a few things, he、yeah. thinks there's a lot more waiting for him. And I think so. At the end of the day, if you think that this is sort of the end point because、mm -hmm. you get to eat, you get to you get shelter, right,、yeah. and you get to provide for your multiple children, it,、mm -hmm. it, it, if you have nothing else to look forward to,、mm -hmm. I think it's not only a, setting a bad example for your children,、mm -hmm. but also just Maybe not the right attitude forward.、Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the second thing about learning, we talked about how you learn English, right? right. And you mentioned that there's a fu gong. There's just a lot of、uh, hard work that goes into <laughs> For it. Sure. Yeah, there's no shortcut. Yeah, yeah. I can. Just the last point. I just want to push back a little bit on your、sure. thing about day one, though. Yeah. Is that isn't there also like a bunch of Silicon Valley people that have done well for themselves that、yeah. ultimately just go out and they start taking, they,、yeah. they're doing yoga,、yeah. they're taking, they're going on these silence retreats, right? And getting therapists and and,、yeah. and meditating all the time, right? right? How it, it almost seems that. That is something that you do、mm -hmm. when you no longer think it's day one. Right. Because if you're in day one, shouldn't you be like sprinting really hard? Right. Right. You do that when you're on like day M, right? Right. Like, right. so how do you reconcile those two mentalities? Yeah, I think the whole even work-life balance, whether we're still going at a nine nine six speed, it's always true to ask, can I go much more, or should I really keep it so that like I have the downtime? I think even throughout my life, I always have like period of extended period of time that I just like really allow myself to regroup, right? Whether I wouldn't say silent retreat or anything, but I did just happen to need that.、Okay. And, but I also I'm also so, so lucky now that for many things I still want to learn and need to do, and actually like work with so many much more people.、Um, Finally, it's at a stage that I don't need the downtime, search elsewhere or move to elsewhere before I can really make that initiative happen. So whether like my next stage, I really would be completely off for a year for doing something different, or like with this stage of my career and life that I can really you know, do more now with my resources without stopping. I don't think there are conflict, and I don't think it conflict with my idea of this is day one, because the world is literally still day one. I really. Well, five, ten years from now, be very different from what we know now. My own role in it is really the mentality, so that I can still be learning. Yeah. Well, thanks for ending on such a positive note.、Right. Thank you very much, Stephen, for coming、yeah. on the show. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Thank you. Thank you.